morning to speak on different but not less in faith. Different but not less in faith. I want to start with the illustration. Uh, you may have heard of a daredevil named the Great Blondin. He was like evil Knievel in his day, and large crowds would gather to watch him do some death-defying stunt. And on one occasion, he stretched a rope across Niagara Falls, and the crowd gathered, and he stood on the rope, and he said, Do you think I can walk this rope to the other side? And the crowd said, We believe. We believe. So he walks to the other side, walks back across. He gets a wheelbarrow. He gets the wheelbarrow up on the rope along with him. And he said, Do you believe that I can push this wheelbarrow to the other side? And they said, We believe. We believe. He said, Okay, I need a volunteer to get into the wheelbarrow. And no one, of course, volunteered. It's one thing to say that we believe. It's another thing to back up the fact that we believe. You know, we say that we're different in faith, but are we really? Is our faith really different than, those of our, than that of our religious friends and neighbors? Because it should be. And if it isn't, there's something deficient in our faith, because I'm convinced that there is something deficient in their faith. We want to talk about three differences that I see in our faith and then in their faith. First of all, we are different in the way that we define faith. We're different in the way that we define faith. You know, you'll find that we're different than the rest of the religious world in the way that we define a lot of things. We're different in the way that we define baptism. Much of the religious world would define sprinkling or pouring as baptism. We would not define it that way. We do not define it that way because the Bible does not define it that way. The word that's used in the Bible is the word baptizo. It means to dip, to plunge, to immerse. Among other things, it can refer to a submerged ship. That's what we're talking about when we talk about something being buried, when we talk about baptism. But they don't use the word that way, and so we have to sometimes define the word. I'll explain the, that when I was in Crossville, Tennessee, I was in the habit of offering the invitation, of course, at the end of every lesson. And as I would offer the invitation, I would say, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be immersed for the remission of your sin. I really didn't even know that I was doing that. It wasn't a conscious thing that I was doing, but I was always saying, be immersed for the remission of your sins. And so after one of the services, a lady came up to me. She wasn't a member of the church. She was the mother of one of our members. She came up and she said, I've got a question. And I said, okay, what is it? She said, why do you always say, be immersed instead of be baptized? And I said, well, and I, I say that because that's what that word means. It means to dip, to plunge, to immerse. And so I, I guess I'm just defining that term. But you see, it was bothering her because she was a Methodist. So she did not believe in having to be buried in order to be baptized. So she was perfectly okay with me saying be baptized because she could define that any way she wanted to. But when I said be immersed, it took that out of her court and it now was forcing her to face up to the fact that that's what the Bible is talking about when it talks about baptism. And that was bothering her. I wasn't doing it to bother her. But I, I can guarantee you I didn't change it after that fact. I kept on saying immerse because I kept on thinking it's getting to her. She's having to think hard about it. I'm not trying to bother her, but I am trying to make her face up to the fact that what she did is not what the Bible says we have to do. You know, the Bible defines baptism as burial. We're buried in baptism with Christ, Romans 6, 3 through 5. And the context there talks about later in verse 17 that we've obeyed that form of doctrine. The death, the burial, the resurrection, we go through that form of doctrine when we're baptized. Jesus died for sin, we died to sin. Jesus was buried in the tomb, we're buried in water. Jesus was raised to newness of life and we are raised to a new life as well. We often point out to people there that if we want to be raised with Him, we have to be buried like Him. And if you weren't buried like Him, then you can't be raised like Him. And so there's a, a, a major importance that you were buried like Him. Because if you were not buried like Him, you don't have the promises that are offered there. Let's talk about how He was buried. 
Remember they placed Jesus in a new tomb. Let me ask you, what was the floor of that tomb made of? You say it was rock. It was carved out of rock. It was rock. What about the sides of, those tomb, of that tomb? Well, they, they were rock. What about the ceiling of that tomb? Well, it was rock too. What about the end of that tomb? Well, it was rock. Well, what did they roll in front of that tomb? A big rock. So Jesus is inside, and in every direction that you can look, up, down, across, around, what is there? Rock. He's completely encased in rock. That's what burial was for him. Burial was being in completely enclosed. Now, what should burial be for us if I'm trying to go through that form of doctrine when I'm baptized? Can my arm be sticking way up? Sticking out? Can my head be sticking out? Can I pour just a little water over my head and call that burial? Does it match to what he did? No, it doesn't match. I've got to be like him in the burial if I want to be like him in the resurrection. And we talk about John the Baptist when we think about baptism. Uh, John the Baptist is one of my favorite characters. He, he does not get enough mention. You know, I must decrease. He must increase. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. Oh, John's such a great man. John the Baptist. Now, Baptist doesn't refer to his religious affiliation. I suppose there's a lot of people today who think that it does. It refers to his occupation, right? Like Simon the Tanner in Acts chapter 10, or Luke the physician in Colossians chapter 4. So we have John the baptizer, John the immerser, or as I sometimes jokingly call him, John the Big Dipper, because that's what he was. He was the Big Dipper. He, he was the guy that baptized all the people. Now, I'd like to be known for a lot of things, but there are a few things I'd like to be known more for than baptizing people. He's the guy that baptizes everybody. You don't want to get around him. Don't spend much time with him. He'll, he'll get you baptized, right? But John was known that way. People traveled out to see him. They traveled out. Somebody said, you get on fire and people will come to see you burn. Well, John was on fire and people were coming out to see him burn. He was a burning and shining light, Jesus said. They were coming out and he was baptizing them. That's, that's what baptism is. We understand the meaning of that term. But what about faith? You know, we define faith differently than much of the rest of the religious world defines faith. For many in the religious world, faith is a leap in the dark. That's what it is. Faith is what you do when you don't know what to do. Faith is what you do in just trusting God and not really having any, any reason to do that. It's just this blind leap in the dark. Well, I don't believe that. That's not how I define faith. Because I don't think that's how the Bible defines faith. In Hebrews 11 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, when I read that verse, it says faith is. So I'm looking for what faith is. I'm looking for a definition, and it talks about substance, and it talks about evidence. There's nothing about that that seems subjective to me. There's nothing about that that seems like a leap in the dark to me. There's something solid about that. In fact, the word substance, you know what that word means? Foundation. Foundation, something underneath. It's the substructure, foundation. And when I think about a foundation, I don't think about a blind leaf in the dark. Now, I think about something solid. I think about somebody pouring concrete, pouring a form, and then building on that foundation. You know, Jesus talked about in Luke chapter 6, in verses 46 through 49, he talked about the wise builder and the foolish builder. And you remember the wise builder laid the foundation on a rock, the Bible says. And it stood when the stream came against it because it was founded on a rock, the Bible says. But then the foolish man, I love the language of, of Luke because Luke says he built it without a foundation. Now Matthew says he built it on the sand. Well, building on the sand is building without a foundation. But Luke just skips through the process and he says he built it without a foundation. There's no foundation to it. Well, there are some people who have a faith and there's no foundation to it. There's other people that have a faith and there's a solid foundation underneath it. Now, that's the faith I have. That's the faith you have. That's the faith we want to have. 
Someone has said that this generation has its feet planted in midair. Uh, that's pretty true of our world. Our world is firmly planted in midair. There's nothing underneath. A lot of people in our world, they have no foundation. They have no foundation for what they believe because they don't believe this book. Because you don't believe this book, you don't have a solid foundation. This is the solid foundation. And I want you to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, just very quickly. I want you to see what Paul's talking about. Because Paul's talking about that these two false teachers who've done a lot of harm, they have overthrown the faith of some. Now the reason why they overthrew it was because it didn't have a foundation. They overthrew the faith of some because their faith didn't have a foundation. Their faith was built without a foundation. Their faith wasn't built upon the rock of truth. But then he says this about the rest of us and the faith that we have. He says in verse 18, "...who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they have overthrown the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal." The Lord knows those who are His. Let everyone who names the names of, name of Christ depart from iniquity. So here are those whose faith has not been overthrown. Solid foundation of God. You can't overthrow God's foundation. You can't overthrow what God lays down. You can overthrow what man does. And, and everything that man plants one day is going to be uprooted. It's going to be overthrown. But the church is never going to be destroyed. Daniel 2.44. Not going to be left to other people. Not going to be left to other kingdoms. It's never going to be destroyed. The foundation's going to stand. Because it's God's foundation. We have a faith that has a foundation. We're so thankful for that. You, you might consider some other passages that talk about this substance. You might think about Psalm 139. But the Moser mentioned yesterday in talking about us being fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and God knowing us. That text says that God knows our frame. We have a frame, and God knows that frame even when we're in the womb. It talks about the substance there being yet unformed. The, the substance isn't, isn't finished yet. We're growing in the womb, but there's already a frame, already a structure to it. I, I love to go by and see a house being built and to see, see it when it's framed. And it's not built yet, but once it's framed, you can kind of see what it's going to be. How big it's going to be, what it's going to look like. You can kind of tell where the rooms are going to be and probably what room they're going to be. You can tell a lot about it. You know, you, you go in, the mother goes in and has the sonogram. You get that picture, right? What's that a picture of? Is that a picture of nothing? Uh, it's a picture of something, something very precious. I mean, I, I've, I've seen some of those sonograms. You can already tell they got a head full of hair. How in the world can you take that kind of picture and already know he's got Elvis hair? But he does. You can already tell those big, fat, chubby cheeks, right? There's not a little fella coming out. This is a big fella. Parker weighed 10, 3 when he was born. You've seen my wife. She's not very big. And I remember when the doctor pulled him out. She had a C-section. The doctor pulled him out. And he said, oh, here's a linebacker. And I thought, well, yeah, probably so. But then I watched the, the nurse that cleaned him up. She had been a nurse a long time. I know that because of the way she handled him. You know, I'm, I got this 10, 3-pound baby, and I'm, I'm uh, holding it like I don't want to drop it. She grabs him by his feet, holds him up, and goes to washing him off. And she's got him up like this, like I would skin a cat or something. She's got him up, and I mean, she's just giving him, he's just begging for his life and crying, and she's just going about her business. Why? Because he's got a frame. He's not hurting him. He may not like it. But she's not hurting him. Well, you look at that sonogram, you can tell. You can tell the outline. You can tell the form. There, there's something there. Other passages in the Bible talk about substance. Even the man in the Old Testament. They came out in the morning, and there was a small round substance on the ground, the Bible says. They gathered it up. There was something to pick up, something to gather. There's something to it. There's something about it that has a shape and a form, something that, that is solid about it. We see that in, in the Bible. So that's the idea of the word substance. But then we have the idea, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The word evidence. It's a word that means proof. It's things by which you prove something. And so we have evidence for our faith. Faith involves evidence. It involves proof. 
Now, when we think about the proof, I love the way Luke talks about Jesus in Acts chapter 1, where he's talking about many infallible proofs. Luke says, there's proof. It's infallible proof, and there's a lot of it. And there is a lot of it. In Acts chapter 2, Peter's going to say, right over there are David's bones. You show me where his, Jesus' bones are. His tomb is empty. David's is full. Why? Because God raised him from the dead. You killed him, but God raised him from the dead. That empty tomb is proof that he was who he said he was. It's the ultimate proof, Romans chapter 1. God, he was proved to be the Son of God, declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection. I've been preaching on the resurrection. I've, I've been back examining my preaching, and I have not preached nearly enough in my lifetime on the resurrection. And I'm correcting that. We're spending weeks talking about the resurrection because I know how important it is and I know how foundational it is to our faith. And we're talking about it. So we've been talking about all these theories that people come up with. You know, the swoon theory. Jesus wasn't really dead on the cross. He just swooned and so they put him in the tomb. It was kind of cold and cool. and So he revived in the tomb and he evidently got up and rolled away a 2,000 pound rock. And walked out of his own tomb, got past the guards, nobody knew it. That's how that happened, we're told. Well, that Roman soldier thought he was dead. And he was in charge of his execution. He'd been charged of other executions. He, he could determine that the other two thieves were not dead and their legs need to be broken. But he didn't break the legs of Jesus because he was dead already. He knew he was dead. He wasn't even questioning his mind. But still, responsible for this man, his life or my life. Acts chapter 12, those Roman soldiers that let somebody escape... They paid with their lives. So a Roman soldier says, we'll just make sure. Ran that spear up into the side of Christ. Through the lung, through the heart, outflowed blood and water. No question about it. He's dead now. No Passover plot. No faking your own death. No taking a strong drug and passing out to later revive. None of that. That's not happening. That's been proven not to be the case. Well, what's another theory? Then we've got to come up with another theory. We can't accept the truth. Well, the women, they just went to the wrong tomb. They got confused. It was dark. It was before, you know, there was a lot of light out. And so they they went to the wrong tomb. And they found a tomb that hadn't been used yet. It was empty. And so they just made the assumption that Jesus had been raised from the dead. They had already been to that tomb. They were at that tomb the day that the body was laid out in that tomb, the gospel writers tell us. They were going back to a place where they had already been. They had already made preparation to do this. You mean to tell me these women went through all the trouble of getting ready to anoint the body of Jesus, take care of the body of Jesus, but they weren't dead sure of where they were going? Oh, they knew where they were going. You mean you're lugging all those heavy spices and doing things, but you don't really know where you're going? Oh, they knew where they were going, and they went to the right place. He just wasn't there. Well, then somebody had to take the body. Okay, who took the body? Well, the Romans took the body. The Romans wanted to make sure that nothing happened, and so they took the body to another location. Really? You mean to tell me Rome didn't think they could guard his tomb sufficiently to keep anybody from taking that body? Oh, the Romans weren't afraid of somebody overwhelming them. They were in charge. They knew they had that body, and that body would stay there as long as they wanted it to stay there. It was sealed under penalty of anybody opening that tomb. they, They weren't worried about that. And if they were, then why did they not produce the body? Why would they anger the Jews in any way? They weren't trying to do that. What about the Jews? Well, the Jews stole the body, okay? Then why didn't they bring it in Acts chapter 2? They could have ended Christianity quickly. You're saying he's raised from the dead. How do you explain this? Here's his decaying corpse right here in front of you. It's over. Case closed. Christianity is false. But they didn't do that. They had to kill the apostles. They had to beat them. They had to threaten them. They had to do all these things. Why? Because they could not shut them up. They concocted a story. The the disciples came and stole the body while, while the soldiers were asleep. Matthew 28. Okay, so the soldiers were asleep. Let me get this. But while they were asleep and while somebody was still in the body, they knew somebody stole the body. They knew who stole the body even though they were asleep at the time. That doesn't make sense. Well, 
Soldiers, if it goes any further, if there's any problem, we'll take care of it. We'll give you a large sum of money. You just repeat the story. They did. If you'd been one of those soldiers, let me ask you, do you want your life in the hands of those Jewish leaders? You really want those Jewish leaders to defend you if this goes any higher up the chain of authority? They're liars and they're murderers and they're paying you to lie and you're going to trust them with your life? If I'd been one of those Roman soldiers, you couldn't get me far enough away from them. They would have let me die in a moment if it would have saved their skin. So then the disciples had to steal the body. Okay, well if the disciples stole the body, then why were they willing to die for something that they knew was a lie? You know, men will die for the truth. Men will die, die for a lie if they believe it to be the truth. But they will not die for a lie that they know is a lie. They just won't do it. One of them would have broken. You know how long it took the conspirators in the Nixon case to break? Powerful men broke almost instantly. They could not keep the story. The disciples went to their graves with the story. But let me, think, let me, let me explain this as well. Men will lie to get out of trouble. Happens all the time. But men don't lie to get into trouble. If the disciples were lying, they were lying to get into trouble. Who does that? I've lied in my life to get out of trouble. No, Mom, I didn't do it. it wasn't me. I never lied to get into trouble. I never lied so I'd get a spanking. I never lied so that I would get a punishment. No, you don't do that doesn't make sense. The only credible explanation is the explanation the Bible gives us. That is that God raised him from the dead. That's the proof that we have. We have that evidence that's presented for us. You know, the Gospels give us evidence for our faith. Our faith is based on a ton of evidence. Let me give you a piece of evidence that I think is overwhelming. And that is Saul of Tarsus. You explain to me how Saul of Tarsus went from making havoc of the church, persecuting Christians, to being a Christian and preaching the faith. You explain how that happened. You explain how he went from rising in Judaism to being on the low rungs of Christianity, being persecuted, followed, bothered everywhere we went. You explain what made that man change, going one direction one moment and going the opposite direction the next. You explain to me that conversion, separate apart from the resurrection. I'm convinced you cannot do it. You cannot do it. You cannot give me another thing that would have changed that man's life as radically as it was changed that quickly other than the resurrection. It changed that day when he heard that voice from heaven. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus of Nazareth. You, you, you mean the disciples didn't steal your body while the guards were asleep? That's what I've been told. That's what I've always believed. I can't believe that anymore because that voice is coming from up there, not down here. I'd have a problem if that voice is coming from down here. It would mean you're still alive. But the fact that that voice is coming from up there tells me you are God's son. You are who you said you were. That's the ultimate proof of it. I've been wrong. I am changing my life because of the proof, because of the evidence that's overwhelmingly presented. You've got to explain that. But let, let's, let's move ahead. I think we're also different in how faith comes. We're different in our understanding of how faith comes. You know, the denominational world, denominational people will talk about God putting faith in your heart. God puts faith in your heart. Well, that's Calvinism. Calvinism is the idea that we're born totally depraved, and as t being totally depraved, then God has to put faith in our heart because we can't respond. It's unconditional election. It's a, it's a direct operation of the Holy Spirit, irresistible grace. It has to take place. I have five minutes. Okay, make sure I had a little bit of time. I want to get to the last point. But I want you to understand that, that we differ in how faith comes because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How shall they call on him whom they've not believed? And how then shall they believe on him in whom they've not heard? And how then shall they hear without a preacher? Romans 10, 14. 
And so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You gotta have a preacher involved in that process, 1 Corinthians 1, 21. So that's how that works. You see it in Acts chapter 15. You see it in Acts chapter 18 in verse eight, they hearing believe. You see that pattern. You see that pattern in Galatians 3, 2 and 5 where it's by the hearing of faith that the Holy Spirit is received. And so we understand the process of hearing, how that comes. But the final point, I want you to see where we differ, is we differ in how faith saves. You see, the denominational world teaches that faith saves alone, by itself. We believe that faith saves, but it is not by faith alone. We believe that we're saved by faith. We don't disagree on that. We simply disagree that it is by faith alone because we understand that faith involves certain acts that God has commanded that we have to do. They have Pentecost, repent, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, going to the city, he'll be told you what you must do. Goes into the city, he's baptized in verse 18. He was told to arise and be baptized, Acts 22, 16. So that's something that God commands. We know James chapter 2, faith without works doesn't profit. We know faith without works is dead. We, we understand that process there. Understand faith and works working together. You know, somebody illustrated this way, and I thought it was a good illustration. If later today I'm going to get on an airplane, as I'm walking back to find my seat on the airplane, I look out the windows and I see a wing on one side of the plane, but on the other side there's no wing. And I kind of stop and I look at that. I look again to make sure I'm seeing it correctly. Well, I look around, all the other passengers, they're getting in their seats, they're putting their luggage away, they're buckling in, they're, they're comfortable. The stewardess sees me and I'm holding up the line, so she comes up and she says, Sir, is there a problem? Yes, ma'am, there's a problem. There's a wing on this side, but there's not a wing on this side. Sir, I know the pilot. He's a good man. He would never endanger any one of us. Just take your seat, buckle in. We've, we've got places to go. No, ma'am, no, ma'am. Would you like for me to call the pilot back here? Yes, ma'am. She calls the pilot back there, and the pilot says, Sir, what's the problem? Wing, no wing. That's my problem. The pilot says, You're putting too much faith in wings. You're too concerned with wings. Don't worry about wings. Don't put your faith in wings. You're fine. What, what am I going to do at that point? I don't care if everybody else stays on that plane. I'm getting off that plane. Because I know that plane's not getting off the ground. And I know that if it does get off the ground, it's going to come back down pretty quickly. And it's not going to be good. I don't want to be on board a plane that has only one wing. I, I understand that faith and works are joined together by God. You, you have faith and repentance joined together. Jesus said repent and believe when he was preaching the gospel. We have faith and confession joined together, Romans 10, 9, and 10. We have faith and baptism joined together, Mark 16 and verse 16. God's joined together. I better not put them asunder. I don't want one without the other. I can't have worship for God in spirit without truth or in truth without spirit. That'd be one wing. It won't work. It won't get off the ground. I can't have law without grace or grace without law. I can't have that. You know, people say there's law in the Old Testament, grace in the New Testament. Oh, no. There's law and grace in the Old, and there's grace and law in the New. Both. You read Genesis 6, 8, you read Exodus 33, and you'll read grace six times, six times. In Exodus 33, when God's talking to Moses, he says, you found grace, you found grace, you found grace, you found grace. There's grace there. There's grace under the law of Moses. Don't ever tell me there's not grace in the Old Testament. There was grace. They wouldn't have made it to the New Testament if there wasn't grace. There was grace. But one wing. I, I don't want to be on a plane with one wing. I don't want to have faith without works. Because that doesn't profit, that won't work, that won't get off the ground. I've got to have both of those. I want you to think about this as we draw this to a close. You know, our denominational friends and neighbors will say, Preacher, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works. Preacher, not of works. Lest any man should boast. Not of works. You see, works are excluded. Well, if all works are excluded, then faith is excluded because this is the work of God that you believe, John 6, 29. You've just excluded what you say you have to have as faith. You just excluded that. And I've heard them say, it's by grace alone through faith alone. It just, you just want to hit yourself upside the head and say, it can't be by grace alone and also be by faith alone. It can be by grace alone or it can be by faith alone, but it cannot be by grace alone and faith alone. 
Can't, they can get two things involved there. That doesn't work. But I want you to understand that they would never have even understood it that way. You know, we read about the history of the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. You know what they had done in Acts chapter 19? Been baptized. You know who had baptized them? Paul. So Paul's writing to them now, and Paul's saying, not of works. Are they reading that and saying, baptism's a work and it's excluded? No, they'd already done it. They didn't see it as an excluded work. They saw it as something they had to do. I do too. You do too. The Bible says that God's not a respecter of persons, but in every nation he that worketh righteous, feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. We have to work righteousness to be accepted of God. You know, Jesus said to John, Suffer it to be so now at his baptism, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus didn't have any sins, no sins to wash away. But he did have to fulfill righteousness. And all of God's commandments are righteousness. Psalm 119, 172. God had commanded baptism through John, and Jesus submitted to the command of God. He, and, and that's why God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Those that fear God and work righteous are accepted of him. God accepted Jesus as his son, said so because of what he did. Later, Jesus would say, John's baptism, is it from heaven? Is it from men? They would say, we can't say. We say it's from heaven. He's going to say, why didn't we do it? If he's saved from men, he's going to say, people are going to get us because they think John's a prophet. But you know what? They couldn't get Jesus because Jesus had submitted to the baptism of John which had declared that it was from God and he had submitted to God's will. Have you submitted to God's will? Does your faith include baptism? Does your faith include obedience to the plan of God? Because if it doesn't, it doesn't meet the biblical description of faith. Acts chapter 10 and verse 48 says that Peter commanded them to be baptized. It's a command of God. It is for the purpose of salvation, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. It is a must, Acts chapter 9 and verse 6. If your faith does not have baptism associated with it, then your baptism will not save. It cannot save because it is not joined to the things that God has joined it to. It is you choosing one side rather than accepting what God has given. And if you do that, you're on a plane with one wing. You're not getting off the ground. And if you do, you're coming down quickly and hard. You don't want to do that. We're different in our faith, in the way we define it. We're different in the way that we believe that it comes, and we're different in the way that we believe that it saves. Thank you for your attention.